I'm Wally Ferrier. This is my trombone. We're going to introduce, uh, do I need to click this forward? There we go. I'm going to introduce this uh, presentation in a very unusual and potentially embarrassing way, depending on what comes out of this thing right now. So, well, here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bring on the band. Ready? Oh, the, the, the game is I'm going to play a set of musical notes and then you call out the name of the song, okay, when I finish. Come on, what, what was it? Let, let me do something for you. Let me change the order of the notes and then, then maybe you can do this again. Now, that song should be obvious, so there's no need to ask what it was. <laughs> Is there? No, okay. So obviously there. And I can see a couple of you Kentucky natives getting a little misty-eyed there. Um, the order mattered. The order of the notes I played mattered. Uh, what came out initially as kind of a scrambled, unfamiliar jumble of musical notes were patterned in a particular sequence of something that was familiar to you. So let's, let's move from music to something a little more relevant uh, to business research. Uh, what I'm presenting today is kind of a, a, a different spin on a paper I published uh, recently in the Strategic Management Journal with some friends, Violina Rindova at the University of Texas at Austin and Rob Wiltbank at Willamette uh, University in Oregon. Um, what we wanted to know and were intrigued by was, uh, and, and the bubble has long since passed clearly, but during an era when internet speculation was going on at its peak, why was it that some stocks were being boosted and, and others not? Why some of these internet companies survived the, the bubble popping and others did not? Uh, clearly at that time there's a lot of herd mentality in, in investing, uh, but clearly it was a, a period where, where some radically new technology, radically new business models were not well understood, but yet being rewarded handsomely by the investment community and, and others failing. So I'm, this is a study involving uh, 50 or more internet companies over about a seven year time period starting in the mid 1990s, ending in about 2002 or so. So I'm just gonna draw two of them uh, as exemplars. So we have VeriSign, which uh, I actually had to look this up. Uh, they're a, uh, a pioneer in terms of the internet certificate authenticity and, con well, kind of the security thing. So when you order something online, uh, you, you know for sure that, you know, it's being encrypted and coded and your payment is actually going to those parties where your payment is expected to go. Uh, Amazon.com clearly is, well, Amazon.com, you, you know what they do. But let me show you some patterns, and this is a, a general pattern, not specific data points per se. Uh, Verisign's, Verisign's stock price. You see that you know, in and around the late 1990s, 2000, 2001 or so, huge swings in terms of their stock price and market capitalization, but yet subsequent to the bubble, kind of traded sideways uh, for some period of time. They were recently, just uh, six months ago or so, uh, purchased by Symantec, you know, the, the very famous uh, virus uh, malware uh, uh, software producer. So it was a happy ending, I suppose, for VeriSign's uh, founders and, and chief executives. On the other hand, um, the Amazon.com stock price followed a similar pattern early on, but over time began to gel into a business model and a strategy that investors and customers, as well as competitors, could understand. So their, their stock price had done reasonably well in, in the last couple of years. Uh, why is this the case? Why has this happened? Uh, we, we've started out with a, with a very nascent, uncertain, ambiguous industry. It is still that to some extent uh, even today, but particularly back then when the investors had no clue what's going on, but willing to pump billions in cash uh, in, in very risky ventures. 
So this, this process of, of attracting investors and having investors use traditional valuation techniques uh, presumes that there's business fundamentals that are well understood, that some of these companies have profitability and cash flow and assets and liabilities that all kind of balance out nicely. Uh, but this is not an established industry back in the, in the 1990s. Instead, it was characterized as a nascent industry in which the, the companies themselves, investors, board of directors, customers, regulators, uh, still trying to figure out what's going on. All of this uh, is occurring within a, a cloud of ambiguity. No general consensus about what a, a tried and true business model is. This is brand new stuff. Uh, no clear causality, if, if I do this in the marketplace, I'll attract customers. There's no really correlation there based on, on experience and data. There is no data. Uh, so what, what's really happened, uh, we believe, is that investment community has used a variety of very subjectively derived uh, valuation heuristics. Uh, beyond lots of the hocus pocus that occurs on Wall Street and lots of the analyst firms, we believe that investors hear particular kinds of melodies embedded in the pattern of competitive actions that these companies carry out over time. Click. Okay. Uh, we drew uh, our hints at explanations from a very eclectic set of uh, perspectives and lenses, gestalt psychology, experimental aesthetics, and my own discipline within strategic management called competitive dynamics. But despite this apparent you know, uh, differences between them, they have remarkable overlap insofar as uh, they're principally concerned or chiefly concerned with how people perceive a variety of stimuli. Now, of course, uh, people in experimental aesthetics, music perception, uh, view the stimuli as coming from an instrument like the trombone here. Uh, other stimuli could be the little signals that internet companies are sending and transmitting out to a variety of audiences and constituencies. What are the, uh, the patterns that, that the investors hear? Uh, so Gestalt psychology suggests that people are hardwired to view the whole. That is, you view a whole set of stimuli um, based on certain collative properties embedded in the stimuli. Sometimes they're in your face and obvious. Sometimes they're very subtle and have, uh, uh, I guess, patterns uh, that are detectable but kind of uh, flow just below the surface, if you will. So some of these collative properties include simplicity, familiarity, predictability, the extent to which elements of a sequence of stimuli are kind of chunked or grouped together, and whether or not Somewhere in the pattern, there is kind of a motif, a general motif that, that occurs. Um, I'll, I'll draw a couple of examples from experimental aesthetics where uh, uh, experimental subjects are, are given uh, a variety of musical you know, notes uh, and, and sequences that, that vary, obviously, in terms of rhythm and pace, uh, pitch and intensity. They vary also in terms of repetition and complexity and familiarity. But by and large, among the many things that experimental aesthetics researchers want to know is, do you see a pattern and do you like it? So liking is kind of a dependent variable here. So here are just three characteristics in terms of the complexity of a series of musical notes, the familiarity as the song I played, or at least the second song I played for you, and certainly the predictability of the order of musical notes. So people generally like things that are a little complex, a little familiar, a little predictable, but taken to an extreme, uh, begin to dislike it. Uh, you know, th think about the, the, the stark differences between uh, a, a children's song that is very simple and repetitious. Uh, this is nothing you're likely to hear on your way to work every morning. It's nothing downloaded to your iPad because it's childish, it's simple, and boring, quite frankly. Uh, but on the other end of the extreme, I, I for one, don't particularly uh, like improvisational jazz very much because it's too out there, it's too noisy, it's cacophonous, uh, to the point where I, I don't follow along with what the musicians are trying to get across in terms of their motif or pattern. Uh, oh, e even insofar as uh, 
uh, uh, experimenting with toddlers, one or two years old, that have had little or no exposure to music at all. They're able to detect, detect patterns and able to communicate whether certain patterns of musical notes are happy or sad or scary. Uh, they're, they're able to do that. So we are kind of hardwired as humans to kind of look at a variety of stimuli coming in and around uh, cut through the noise and basically look to some of these characteristics and, and interpret them. Insofar as what internet companies have done uh, to try to make themselves bigger and more legitimate and, and to certainly have the capability of, of sustaining their business models, whatever they happen to be, uh, they, they do a lots of things in the marketplace, introducing new products and services, forming uh, distribution and marketing uh, alliances with a variety of other internet companies, certainly trying to um, get bigger by way of acquisitions and joint ventures, etc. So these are what we call competitive actions, things that are visible and observable in the marketplace, not only by customers, but also by rivals as well as investors too. What I've done to make things uh, hopefully make things very simple for you in, in some of the slides yet to come, is to provide uh, you know, whatever dozen or so actions that internet companies actually do to dis distill it down to a, a, a generic set of A, B, C, D, and E actions. I've color-coded them for you that in, for reasons that will become obvious in just a second. So let's get away from the details of the actions and just look at the patterns of things themselves. So I want to use musical notes as kind of a metaphor for competitive behavior that investors are going to observe, detect patterns in, and evaluate as they make their decisions. Sequence of musical notes, sequence of competitive actions. Okay, here we go. Uh, I got some ideas on, on actually how to do this in terms of method and measurement from my wife who has her uh, doctorate in molecular biology. She studies the, you know, the sequencing of DNA components and nucleotides and proteins and all that. Uh, so I'm, I'm struggling with ways to characterize a pattern of sequence of, of actions in, in very much the same way. And she said, well, use sequencing methodologies and technologies. And, and I did, and, and it's uh, borne some uh, excellent fruit here. Optimal matching analysis is one element of sequence analysis that allows you to compare one sequence of things with, with another sequence of things. Uh, and, and there's a variety of algorithms on how to do that. But what, what you see here is a sequence of things carried out by VeriSign, a sequence of things carried out by Amazon.com. And as time unfolds, you can map out VeriSign sequence in this particular way. And you can compare it and, and just eyeball it here for us today on, on what Amazon has done. Uh, so making no value judgments here, but uh, see, clearly you can see that the pattern is different. Okay, I've given each action category, A, B, C, D, or E, not only its different color code, but also different vertical space, so as to kind of emulate kind of a, a musical uh, a range of musical notes. One of the first properties of Gestalt psychology that enables humans to detect patterns is how predictable the pattern is over time. So here we have a sequence of musical notes uh, carried out by Amazon in one time period, and you can compare what it does in the subsequent time period, and the one after that, and the one after that. To the extent that these sequences are similar, it means that Amazon.com is being somewhat predictable, and investors are able to grasp onto that and understand it. They may not like what they see, but at least they understand it. You may not like what I played on the trombone a little while ago, uh, but that's kind of irrelevant. At least you understood what, what it was. So predictability aids in interpretation of, of patterns. VeriSign, on the other hand, from time period to time period, uh, seems to carry out a pattern of actions that are not similar over time. And you can eyeball this too and see that, well, pretty much they're, they're different patterns in terms of the peaks and valleys here. One of the other characteristics of, of uh, these collegial properties of pattern stimuli is the extent to which it is familiar. So here I'm comparing Amazon.com's sequence of competitive actions with what everyone else in the internet sector is doing. 
Here in the internet sector, they need not be head-to-head -head competitors like Coke and Pepsi is, but they are competing for reputation and legitimacy in terms of the investment communities. Quite frankly, it was very difficult to tell who was competing with whom back in, in, the, in the early uh, nascent part of the internet industry. This is just based on, you know, I, I've got a, a chunk of cash, I'm willing to bet it on one of the internet companies, which one? Which one do I pick? At least I'm familiar, Amazon.com is, is undergoing certain pattern like everyone else in the industry is, whereas VeriSign is not. What they're doing here in terms of the, their particular uh, sequence of, of musical notes, if you will, is very different from that of the industry norm, and you can see that, that it's quite different. Another part of uh, sequence analysis is to measure the extent to which actions or, or elements of any sequence, for that matter, are, are kind of near one another, temporally proximate to one another. So here you see um, what's called a, a separation score be between elements on average. You, you, I'm going to run this again. You see that Amazon.com sequence unfolds over time, but then you see kind of these coupling of the BD pairs, the AC pairs, but also nested within that you've got the ACE triads, if you will. So it's like a boxer stepping up, boom, 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 a combination punch that works particularly well. The BD, the ACE kind of works, whoops, works kind of all together pretty well. Uh, that aids in recall and interpretation, whereas VeriSign has very much a random, stochastic, uh, fuzzy, and noisy kind of pattern here. There's not much chunking going on. Some of Herb Simon's early work on memorization and recall and, and pattern recognition using chess players uh, find that chunking aids in, in, in terms of recall and one chess player able to, to better uh, uh, fight against the other one. Another uh, final one I'll talk about is, is the motif. And clearly there is a motif in the song, My Old Kentucky Home, or you know, whatever Liz was trying to sing. Uh, there, there's some motif in there. Uh, but by and large, companies do this by their observed behaviors as well. So sequence analysis enables to find, on average, that A's occur early in the sequence, followed by D's, and then certainly B's and, and E's and C's. That's the motif, that's the game plan. Whereas uh, VeriSign uh, exhibits kind of a stochastic randomness to when these things occur earlier or late in the sequence. Uh, clearly, uh, a motif either in your face obvious or subtle and something that needs a little massaging and thought on, on behalf of investors aids in their perception and therefore aids in their valuation. So a couple of uh, research results that uh, kind of conform with our, our predictions. Uh, in nascent industries as opposed to established industries, uh, the presence of collative properties in the sequence of competitive behaviors aids in the perception and valuation of internet companies. And this could apply also to other nascent industries, not just the internet. Think about clean energy as we move forward in the future. What's clean energy? Who knows? We have a, a sense of what that is now. That's likely to change as new companies come up with new models. Nanotechnology, um, not pharmaceuticals, but nutraceuticals. Uh, the, these are all emerging industries and, and dozens and dozens I'm not even aware of that have these same market properties that you can't evaluate their stocks and their future uh, earnings potential based on traditional valuation techniques. So the valuation of internet stocks uh, are actually higher when their action patterns exhibit simplicity, predictability, familiarity, chunking, and, and a decidedly uh, visible motif. Now what's uh, kind of surprising here to us is that these properties of a company's competitive strategy and how it ha has a positive impact on stock price are exactly opposite of what we have found in established industries. So airlines, computers, automobiles, uh, beer, cigarettes, software, uh, all at, at this day and age established industries where in fact being unpredictable, being different, being aggressive, uh, being unfamiliar is actually better for performance. And those are the properties 
uh, espoused by uh, Rich Devaney, for instance, in terms of his work in hyper-competition. You want to be aggressive. You want to take away your, your rival's advantage by maneuvering cleverly and creatively around them. That's not the case in nascent industries. So it was, it was surprising. So I hope you enjoyed the music. Hope you enjoyed the, uh, the presentation. And I thank you very much.